Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know that we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled, The Teachings of Jesus. These are the lessons we study from July, August, and September of 2014. And this is lesson number seven in that series for August 16 of 2014. This has been a very interesting series, and it's going to be it's getting even more interesting as we move along. I hope you've had a chance to learn to, to, to review all the lessons. I hope also that you've got your Bible handy, because we're going to be looking at a number of verses, especially in the Gospels. So if you'll join us for a word of prayer, we'll get started. Our loving Father, we thank you for your presence which has been with us and is with us every day, for the ways in which you protect and guide and care for us. And now help us to learn from your example. Learn from the ways you treated people and the ways you taught when you were here on this earth. May we represent you in the ways we live as we learn from you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't think I need to tell anyone that Jesus set an incredibly high standard by which Christians are supposed to live. He not only lived according to the standard which he set, but he asked us to do that. And the incredible thing is he lived up to that standard even from his childhood. Uh, and he gave examples in his teachings from even from the experiences of others. And we'll look at some of those. The principle of Christian love, and, and isn't, isn't that what the Christian church is supposed to be known for? That kind of love, we call it agape love, the, the love which is based on principle, not on feelings or emotions, but based on this person is a fellow brother or sister, a son or daughter of God, and therefore we should treat them as such. That principle was taught by Jesus himself in Old Testament times. Of course, in the Old Testament, we should refer to him as Christ, the God of the Old Testament. And look at those verses just to uh, get a, a start. Leviticus 19 and verse 18 says this, Do not take revenge on anyone or continue to hate him, but love your neighbor as you love yourself. I am the Lord. Now, let's just take a second here and ask ourselves, who is... God speaking to at this point in time, and what was their situation? He was speaking to the Israelites who mm -hmm. had wandered in the wilderness for probably about 40 years after leaving a couple hundred years or at least many generations of slavery in Egypt. Okay. But actually, the book of Leviticus is written right after, well, as the temple is being constructed. Okay. So that the would beginning. be at the very beginning of that 40 year period. If you drop down a few verses to verse 33 of Leviticus 19, it goes on, Do not ill-treat foreigners who are living in your land. Treat them as you would a fellow Israelite, and love them as you love yourselves. Remember that you were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So what's the standard by which we're supposed to judge others, or not judge others, by which we're supposed to love others? As we love ourselves as we love ourselves. Do you know anybody that doesn't love themselves? Kara, yeah, I suppose with, in your experience with uh, some of the psychiatric patients, you've seen people who didn't love themselves yes. very much. There's some drastic things. But in general, human beings love themselves way too much, probably. Well, and probably Carrie's patients treated others as they, with the same respect that they they had for themselves, yeah, exactly. Well, if you look back in the ancient societies and writings that were what's available to us from ancient times, um, there's an interesting development down to history. A very ancient code called the Code of Hammurabi from the area of Babylon says something like, if you don't want your sibling to do something bad to you, don't do it to them. And I suspect that probably was originated with Eve, <laughs> talking about Cain and Abel, you know. Uh, that's the kind of thing that every mother must have said to her kids a lot of times, you know. If you don't want your brother to hit you, don't hit him. Doesn't that make sense? 
<coughs> but it's very interesting because God goes beyond that, as we'll see when we get it, especially in the New Testament. He says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he's finally going to, in the New Testament, in the, in the Golden Rule, he's going to say what? Love others if I have loved you. Yes, and even beyond that, the Golden Rule says, do, do unto, unto others as you want them to do unto you. How's that different than the Code of Hammurabi? Don't do unto others the things you don't want them to do unto you, or do unto others the thing you would like them to do unto you. What's the difference? Is those are just mere images of each other? Uh, one has more of a positive frame of reference, and the other has more of a negative frame of reference. Yeah, and what, what are the implications of that? Have you thought about it? You're supposed to be <clears throat> proactive. Yeah, that don't do anything to somebody else that you don't want them to do to you. That means you do nothing, right? But if you say, do unto others what you would like them to do unto you, that's a proactive stance. That means you should be out there doing wonderful things for people all the time, right? If I want somebody to give me some money, I should give them some money? Well, I don't remember money being mentioned specifically. <laughs> Well, is it just a saying, or, or is it in the Bible? Did Jesus talk about uh, sins of omission and commission? Omission. He talks about them, but he doesn't use those words. If, if the sins, the, the usual sins of commission we talk about are, are spelled out in several places. Uh, the most basic New Testament definition of the sins of omission would be found in uh, Romans 14, 23 and 1 John 3, 4. The sins of omission are better spelled out in James 4.17, but those are clearly in the New okay, Testament. Okay, Ken, the sins of omission is when you can do something and you just... Don't do it. You say your hands are tied, you can't do it. And the sins of commission is when, like, you go out and rob, you do something you're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. So does Jesus look upon the sins of omission where you just let the injured person lie and go around them as seriously as if you committed? I think probably you better ask him that question. <laughs> um, they're both sins. There's no question about that. Uh, oh, okay. Sins are not weighted. Okay. Well, they are. They are. Sins are weighted. Um, for Seventh-day Adventists, if you want to see how sins are weighted, it's, there's a very interesting paragraph on page 30 of Steps to Christ where it basically says things like, we look at the drunkard and we look at the drug addict and we think, those awful, awful people, but we are you know, let weighed down with selfishness and pride and those are the sins that God regards as particularly serious, which we don't want to hear very loud. <laughs> we, don't, we don't really like to hear that noise. But it's the principle, isn't it? If mm -hmm. everybody in this Earth's history had been doing unto others, we wouldn't have had all the bloodshed and the wars mm -hmm. and all that stuff, and all the problems we see in our own country right now. Mm -hmm. It says, be good to the stranger, but you know, what we're seeing here and there is a bit beyond that, isn't it? Well, the interesting thing is, if you stop and think about this, that don't do to your neighbor the things you don't want him to do to you, the, the negative version of Hammurabi, leads to the eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Yeah. Because if he did it to me, then so help me, I'm going to do it to him, you see. Yeah. If you say, do unto others the things you want them to do unto you, there's no, there's no eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth in that one. It's a very different thing. Is the sin of pride a sin of omission or commission? The, does both. pride lead? Both, yes. Pride can lead to both. Okay. Yes. Well, and, and wasn't the uh, rule of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, trying to tone people down from, if you scratch my car, I'm going to shoot you. Mm -hmm. That the equivalent of that. Yeah. Well, there well, were death penalties for uh, minor infractions. Yeah. In 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 ancient times, if you were a high, one of the higher level more richer, more wealthy, more influential people in society, and someone of a lower caste did something relatively minor to you, you could have him, uh, you know, his hand cut off or even have him killed. And, and this was a, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's equal across the board. And that was Lex Talionis? Yeah. And that's better than what was before Moses' time, yes, definitely. 
Are you saying that God ratcheted us down to the day when Jesus came and Jesus taught us <clears throat> what real love is? So we've been, we've been trained? Well, God has been working on us. He's been working on us, okay. Yeah. But finally, when Jesus comes, of course, he sets the highest standard of all. And what's that high standard? Love as I've loved you. Well, look, look, look at John 13, 34, and 35. That's the place where it's spelled out most clearly. And Jesus, of course, John 13, where are we? Geographically in John 13? Do you remember? In the no. upper room. In the upper room. Oh. This is, he's just about ready to leave the upper room. He's speaking his last words to his disciples. And he says, and now I give you a new command. Love one another. That's not a new command. What's new about that? We just read it from Leviticus. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now that is a new command. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you're my disciples. How do you understand verse 35 there? If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you're my disciples. What is that saying to us? As Christians, we shouldn't fight. Yeah, but it's more than that. Mm -hmm. Our actions yeah. should yeah. show yeah. who we belong to. Okay. I think mm -hmm. even more. You've got to go a little deeper. When, when he says, as you love each other, does he mean just within the church, or does he mean as you love each other in the whole world? What, how's Presumably it's everybody. Everywhere. But the thing is this, look at this. If you have love for one or another, then everyone, how many are included under everyone? Everyone. You will know that you're my... In other words, he, God is saying the level of love that Christians should display to their fellow man is completely a level by itself. It's not, nothing else is even close. So if someone sees that, they go, wow, he must be a disciple. Should be obvious. I don't recall anybody saying that about me. Well, then maybe that's, maybe that's why we're studying this I lesson. Can, I can think of people about whom that has been said, mm -hmm. and then later on you discover that they weren't that way. We're still human, huh? <laughs> it would be nice to make a list of people who meet that standard. Yeah. Well, well and, and the question I would ask is, how is that possible for naturally selfish people? human beings. It's impossible on your own. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Every day is a new battle, but you keep trying and hope the Spirit is with you. Ellen White has some very incredible words about that, and I'd like to read several short passages from her about this. The first one is found in Use Instructor, so it was written particularly for young people, October 20 of 1892. Paragraph 2, in case you wish to look it up. Love was the element in which Christ moved and walked and worked. He came to embrace the world in the arms of his love. Okay, let's try another one. This is actually the next paragraph. We are to follow the example set by Christ and make him our pattern until we shall have the same love for others as he has manifested for us. He seeks to impress us with this profound lesson of love. Okay? Now how does one go about following the example set by Jesus? The only way I know of is, say, every day have a time when we, you take, in one place in Desire of Ages, I think it's, what, 48? She says, spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. And say, okay, how can I today be like that? And then tomorrow you look at another example in the life of Christ. How can I today be like that? I don't know any other way to accomplish that. Because what you're doing actually is you're asking the Holy Spirit to come into your life and make the changes necessary. You can't do it. I can't do it. None of us can do it on our own. It's, this is not a, a, a case of, you know, uh, every day we get better and better. This is saying, Holy Spirit, I can't do this, but I think this is what I would like to do. I want to be like this. You come in and you 
help me to make those step-by-step -step changes in my life that will produce that kind of result. Yeah, that's kind of scary. Scary or not is where we need to go. Well, it's scary unless you trust the Holy Spirit yeah. uh, because that's like giving yourself over to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And it's really scary to give yourself over to something. I mean, there's... There I think that's kind of what happened in the early rain, and maybe it's going to happen again in the latter rain. The Holy Spirit can get kind of personal. <laughs> 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 Wonderful! <laughs> it sounds great! <laughs> well, look at this. If you think that's tough, look at this one. Now I'm going to go back to Desire Pages on page, page 70, and you might want to read this. You might think I, maybe I'm misquoting here. From his earliest years, he was possessed of one purpose. He lived to bless others. Now, I know you all had kids aged two or three that just couldn't think of anything else to do except to bless others. <laughs> but my children weren't quite <laughs> like that. <laughs> For this, he found resources in nature. New ideas of ways and means flashed into his mind as he studied plant life and animal life. Jesus was studying nature to find ways in which he could bless others. She goes on. Jesus was the fountain of healing mercy for the world. And through all those secluded years at Nazareth, his life flowed out in currents of sympathy and tenderness. The aged, the sorrowing, the sin burden, the children at play in their innocent joy, the little creatures of the groves, the patient beasts of burden, all were happier for his presence. He whose word of power upheld the worlds would stoop to relieve a wounded bird. There was nothing beneath his notice, nothing to which he disdained to minister. Mm. Okay, how does that scratch you? Are all happier for our presence? That's, That's quite a standard. Question. Yes. Well, going on. Jesus worked, this is still in his childhood, when he was a child, when he was a teenager. Jesus worked to relieve every case of suffering that he saw. He had little money to give, but he often denied himself of food in order to relieve those who appeared more needy than he. His brothers felt that his influence went far to counteract theirs, and of course they were selfish and so forth. He possessed a tact which none of them had, or desired to have. When they spoke harshly to poor degraded beings, Jesus sought out these very ones and spoke to them words of encouragement. To those who were in need, he would give a cup of cold water and would quietly place his own meal in their hands. As he relieved their sufferings, the truths he taught were associated with his acts of mercy and were thus riveted in the memory. Desire of Ages, page 87, paragraph 1. You want, him, you want your lessons to impact people? So well. Jesus was different than the culture around him. And his brothers felt his influence went far to counteract theirs. Does that mean they really didn't like him seeing, uh, doing, when he, they wanted him to treat the people as they treated the people? Exactly. It was, anno it was annoying. Why was it annoying? Let me ask you. Why was it annoying to them? Showed them up. Yeah, exactly. They knew that that's the way they should be acting, but they didn't want to act that way. One more. Jesus did not contend for his rights. Often his work was made unnecessarily severe because he was willing and uncomplaining. So his brothers, I'm sure, were very happy to let him carry the, the bulk of the work. Yet he did not fail or become discouraged. He lived above these difficulties, as if in the light of God's presence. I'm sorry, God's countenance. He did not retaliate when roughly used, but bore insult patiently. They might have even tormented him some, you know. Yeah. Quite possible. Now, um, It's easier to, while you're thinking about your question, your comment, it's easier to understand how he could act like that later in life when you realize he was doing this as a kid. So this sort of thinking and behavior as a child might explain some of the healings and ministering to people that seemed 
like he got himself in trouble with the officials for uh, yeah for um, you know overstepping the boundaries yeah you know, healing people that uh, on Sabbath etc. Well, what do we know about how Jesus felt about people who were in need and so forth around him? Look at a few verses. Matthew 9, 36. As he saw the crowds, his heart was filled with pity for them because they were worried and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I wonder if he ever did any sheep herding. Look at Matthew 14, verse 14. Jesus got out of the boat, and when he saw the large crowd, his heart was filled with pity for them, and he healed those who were ill. Let's try one more. In the next, the next chapter, 15, verse 32. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel sorry for these people because they have been with me for three days and now have nothing to eat. I don't want to send them away without feeding them, for they might faint on their way home. He's been preaching, ministering to them, teaching them, healing their wounds, etc., for three days. And he says, now it's time for them to go home. Let's feed them before they go home. Are we getting a hint about how we should follow the example of Jesus? Well, having learned this lesson during his childhood, as noted above, Jesus continued to look with pity and compassion on all those who swarmed about him during his ministry. He had pity on the blind, Matthew 20, verse 34, on the lepers, Mark 1, verse 40 to 41. And I, I have to stop there for a second. You know, the Bible to most people is a serious book. To me, it's a very serious book, but it's full of humor as well. I just love this because if you touched a leper, what, what would happen to you in, in Old Testament times or even New Testament times? You were an outcast. You, you, were, you were unclean for an extended period of time. But when Jesus touched the leper, what happened? The leopard was healed. The leper was immediately clean. So you couldn't say Jesus had touched the unclean oh. thing because <laughs> as soon as he touched it, he was clean. And so, I mean, what, what could the priest say? You know, the people, the Pharisees are about, I'm sure they were saying, he touched a leper, he was, oh no, the guy's clean. Mm. You know, it, it, must have, it must have just annoyed them, but it just, I'm sure Jesus at least had an inside smile. I'm sure he didn't, he never, he didn't want anyone to feel bad, but he smiled to himself as he cleansed the lepers. Particularly where they were the ones that had to check them out when they came yep. to be... And it, the time when, when he healed 10 lepers, one of them was a Samaritan, he told him, go to the priest straight away, don't tell anybody. And why did he tell him that? If the news got to the priest before they got there to be checked out, what would likely happen? Trouble. Well, they would say, no, you're not well. Yeah. Was that Jesus? No, he doesn't know how to heal. He can't heal lepers. You're not well. And, you know, the, the, the priest might be lying through his teeth, but, you know, what do you do? So Jesus said, get there as fast as you can go. Don't say anything to anybody so you can get a fair announcement from the priest before he knows what happened. Now, why were not the priest rejoicing over these healings? Economics. <laughs> Economics. <laughs> their livelihood. Yeah. Their position. Uh, their whole standing in the... Yeah. But not, not only, yeah, not, not just economics, which is, no, I mean, yes, that was part of it. But obviously, I mean, these are the people who were supposed to be taking care of the sick. Yeah. And they couldn't do anything. And Jesus healed them. And they were trying to discredit Jesus and everything he did. And so what happens when the person that you're discrediting is healing all the sick people you can't heal? He's teaching lessons and they're all <laughs> believing him. They don't believe you anymore. I mean. But what character flaw causes that? Is that pride or is that selfishness or what character all, flaw? All of the above. All of the above for that crowd, yeah. Yeah. And more. And remember that pride and sin both have one letter right in the middle. I. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus had a special pity on a widow whose only son 
had died. And just let me read those verses. You all know the story. But Luke 7, starting with verse 12, Just as he, that is Jesus, arrived at the gate of the town, a funeral procession was coming out. The dead man was the only son of a woman who was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart was filled with pity for her, and he said to her, Don't cry. And why did he say that? Then he walked over, and try to imagine this. Here's a group of six guys, at least probably, carrying a coffin. And there's a dead guy in the coffin, okay? He walks over to the coffin, and the, and the men carrying it stopped. Jesus said, young man, get up, I tell you. The dead man sat up, sat up and began to talk. And Jesus, <laughs> you know, again, I, I, you know, these guys are carrying this guy on, his sho on their shoulders, okay? And all of a sudden, he's sitting up and he's talking. And they're, they're probably, you know, you <laughs> probably had a hard drop land. Him and run. <laughs> a hard drop, land and drop him and run. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yes. not, probably not, but you, you could, I, maybe my mind is crazy, but I, I just imagine these things. Um, and they have lids on those coffins? Probably not. They pro it probably wasn't a coffin. It was probably just a board, and he was wrapped in a cloth on top of it, mm. probably. Was like. that Jesus' first raising from the dead? As far as we know, yeah. I mean, and what, what do you think all the crowds around thought? Mm. It made mm -hmm. an impression. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was the same town where he had performed his first miracle at the wedding feast. Did the scientists then say that the person was not really dead? Well, I don't think they said it right then. I think there's too many people would have said, what in the world is wrong with you? We know, we know better than that. But later, they tried to argue, well, he, the only reason he could have done that, the only possible way he could have done that is the man wasn't really dead. And they said the same thing about Jairus' daughter. That's why they had to wait for four days with for Lazarus. Lazarus. And not only that, wait till all the people from Jerusalem had come out to give their, you know, their condolences, et cetera, and everybody's there. Okay, Jesus says, are we sure now that he's really dead? Yes, we're sure he's really dead. Okay, Real now I think it's so. time I can no raise it from the dead. And the people say he stinks. Yeah. So no doubt in anybody's mind this cat's dead. And don't, don't, <laughs> <laughs> don't roll the stone back. He smells. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's look at some other maybe contrasting, possibly contrasting situations. Um, well, we'll look at a couple more that are like that first before we, we do that. Um, look at Mark 10, verse 21. Jesus looked straight at him with love and said, You need only one thing. This, of course, was the young man who was rich. You need only one thing. Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor, and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. How long does it take for a person to become like this? A lifetime? Well, now let's see. Uh, I'm getting up there and I'm not like that yet. I'm, so, so. I, I, I guarantee you that it's never too late to start. Well, I know, but, but. Uh, but, but, but. What? Uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't, just, just, it doesn't, it just doesn't, doesn't come look that. like I'm going to quite make it. So, yeah, well, so let's you do anything then? What, 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 what? What's, what's going to happen here? <laughs> well, that's a fair question. And the answer is, God judges us based on our progress, not on having reached the goal. And we've got the rest of eternity to reach the goal. Well, but there's a lot of us that make, start making progress after most of our life has gone by. That's okay. What's wrong with that? The direction we're headed. It's the direction we're headed. You know, today I talked to this very sweet, sweet lady, 92 years old, talking about she wanted to stay in her house, her children wanted her to go, and um, she and her husband had passed five years ago, and just a lovely lady, and she talked about how she still is sociable and talks to people and stuff, and I, uh, we were talking about the nice people at the club that she can talk to, and I asked her, and I says, well, I says, and do you have a church community? And she stopped, and she says, church. She says, I've never gone to church. 
Really? And I was absolutely floored. 92-year-old lady, and she was very sweet, very kind. She's active in the community. And she was absolutely stumped when I mentioned church. And you could tell her thoughts were like, that's something I've never done. Wow. So I'm anxious to talk to her again, mm -hmm. but um, you never know. And yeah. a person can look like they're living like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Doesn't well. say too much for church, does it? <laughs> we're going we're gonna to read about some people like that when we get to the end of this lesson. So oh, okay. thank you for bringing that point up. Well, did Jesus always act loving and kind? When he was in the temple overturning the tables, was that loving and kind? Well, what was wrong with that? They were making a marketplace out of the temple. Wasn't that a good thing to do? Chase them out? Yes. Part of teaching. Yeah. <clears throat> what um, about when he called the Pharisees and Sadducees whitewashed walls? Yeah. <laughs> Vipers and snakes and children of the devil. The, the five. Yeah, what about this one? John eight forty four. you are the children. This is Jesus standing before what was supposed to be the most righteous group of people in the world. Okay, the Sanhedrin, the leaders of the Jewish nation. And he said, you are the children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires. Totally is that true. loving? <laughs> Maybe. It honest. made one of them change. He went on to explain why. <laughs> they didn't want to hear it. So Nicodemus was part of that group. Yes. So was Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, and they and maybe Simon. And they changed. Mm -hmm. Paul certainly should have made you think, and some did. Okay. There's a very interesting verse that many of us have uh, not maybe taken as we should have. Look at Acts 15, verse 5, just in quick passing here. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. And this is talking about the argument between those who thought that all new converts would have to be like, have to become Jews before they could become Christians. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, how many Pharisees became Christians? Many of them did. Who, who was the famous, most famous one? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. No. Oh. Oh. Uh, Paul. Paul. Paul was by far the most famous one who became Pharisee, who became a Christian. Well, Jesus was questioned about his lifestyle and his actions on several occasions. And one occasion is very well known. It's found in Luke 10. Jesus answered, there was once a man who was going, and, and they asked him, you know, you, you know this story, he, Jesus says, you know, you must do this and all this wonderful stuff. But the teacher of the law wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered, there was once a man. Now, the, this, is a, this, a, this is a discussion. We need to understand that this is a discussion that the Jews were having all the time. It was a question is, should Sadducees treat Pharisees as neighbors? Should Pharisees and Sadducees treat other priests as neighbors? Should the priests treat the Levites as neighbors? Should the Levites treat the ordinary people as neighbors? You know, who among our Jewish society do we really treat as brothers and sisters? I mean, this is a serious question, folks. Well, it's a serious question because God also told the Jews to be separate. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. and, and to stay away from the heathens. So I can see the debate on who is our neighbor. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I'm sure it was probably mainly the Pharisees, had, had put this lawyer up to this question because they hoped to get Jesus locked into this discussion that they, were, they thought they were really good at. So how does Jesus take up the debate? He tells a story. And you all know the story of the Good Samaritan. I probably don't need to recount it considering the fact that our time is rushing past. So, one of the most noteworthy occasions was a question that came from a boy who apparently was also a very good Bible student because when, when he asked what's, what are the commandments, he, Jesus said, what do, you, what do you say? And remember, he answered the question himself. And then, of course, he asked, you know, well, who's my neighbor? Now, Jesus is preaching on the other side of the Jordan. 
he's coming up close to the time when he's going to be, uh, you know, crucified. He doesn't dare preach openly in, in um, Judea or Galilee because they're looking for him to catch him there. But as usual, there was a very mixed group of people listening to him, including Pharisees and no doubt some Sadducees. The priests and the rabbis had encouraged the lawyer to ask this question to try to entangle Jesus in an argument which they hoped to win. Look at, look at Desire of Ages, page 497, if you wondered where I got those ideas. Instead of entering into one of their long arguments, Jesus simply told the story of the Good Samaritan. And this was, now I quote from Desire of Ages, page 499, this was no imaginary scene, but an actual occurrence which was known to be exactly as represented. The priest and the Levite who had passed by on the other side were in the company that listened to Christ's words. So now my question is, how would you have felt, how do you suppose the priest and the Levite felt as they heard this story? Dumbfounded. This has to be a special man that knows. There was no one around that saw me do it, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They probably looked around and wonder if anybody knows <laughs> I was that priest and I was that Levite. Well, it's interesting to notice when Jesus got done with that argument, what did he say? He turns to the lawyer now, in your opinion, because now he's, he's, he's he, he, every time the lawyer asks a question to him, what does he do? He turns the question back to them, right? So now, he, now he's told his story. In your opinion, he says to the lawyer, which one of these three acted like a neighbor towards the man attacked by the robbers? The teacher of the law answered, the one who was kind to him. The lawyer would not even mention the Samaritan by nationality. Hmm. So you... By the way, here's a good, a good little quiz, a little bit of trivia, and this is more than just trivia. When you hear a comment like that, you know which gospel this is found in. Why? That's what I'm asking you. Why? How do you know that? Luke, the one who wasn't a Jew. The one who wasn't a Jew. Mm -hmm. All the, the only Samaritan story that's found outside of the book of Luke is a story where Jesus met this woman, met with the Samaritan woman at the well, and, and sent her to to evangelize her village. That's the only one that's in the Gospel of John, which was, of course, which was written much later. Every other thing about Samaritans is only in the Gospel of Luke. So, are you saying now that these saintly, be like Jesus, Gospel writers of the Gospels are? Uh, Prejudiced? Yeah, that's a good word. <laughs> do they I aren't quite as. Pr they aren't like Jesus. They aren't living like Jesus here. Do, do I have to answer that question? Well, that's a. P I think the answer is pretty obvious, isn't it? Well, then that raises other questions. I it mean, does. How, how, how much? Of course, not of us. Question. How mm -hmm. how much validity can now can you put into the to the writings of the Gospels because we've got these people here that aren't even living well, like Jesus. Let me, let me say that it's fair when they quote Jesus directly, that you can see into the very heart of the one you need to be like. They may be as selfish as you can possibly imagine, but this, these stories, these stories got reported because they stuck in their minds, they could not get it out of their minds because of exactly the thing you're talking about. This is not the kind of stuff that the average Joe Blow does. You know, there is an excellent lesson in here because with the internet and the blogs, we're writing and ripping each other up and everything like that. What we should do is study how Jesus talked to people, how he talked to leaders, how he told parables, and maybe be an example of that when we write rather than falling prey to what is going on on the internet. So this, and not just on the internet, let's talk about this now. When someone mistreats us, how do we respond? In kind. <laughs> Most of the time. Well, and think, no, of, think of ways where I wish Jesus. you folks out there in the audience were here to participate in this argument, <laughs> this discussion. <laughs> 
I hope you're thinking about this. W aren't we the people who are supposed to be the final generation? Wouldn't we like to be the final generation that manages to bring the gospel alive to a world that's in terrible need? So we shouldn't be just acting like Jesus, we should be talking like Jesus. All of the above. Our viewers can respond. We take emails <laughs> yeah. on sure. our website. Jesus like emails. <laughs> We'd love to get more like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would rejoice in that kind of email. I think that, uh, there's a place in the Bible where it says, be he perfect, yeah. be mature. But I believe it's true, as you mature, as you learn more about uh, the Bible, you change. Because there are way back when, the way I would respond w to something, I would not respond to it the s yeah. in the same way now. You know, there's a passage that uh, I scratch my head over, that uh, it's an Ellen White passage, where it says we are to be as perfect in our sphere as God is as perfect in His sphere. That's so a commentary on her verse yeah. in Matthew 5, 48. So that's a... That's a, that's a yeah. And here we just said that these guys right in here writing weren't that way because they Well, were. let's take another one since the time is rushing past. You all know the story about the parable of the sheep and the goats found in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. And Jesus says that the judgment at that point turns on what kind of behavior, well, what, what, what does it turn on? Let me not prejudice you. Can you read it? Oh, we can read, yeah, let me read at least the first part of it. Well, read this, the part when, when he says what it turns on. Well. He will put the righteous, I'm reading, I'm reading now Matthew 25, I'll start with verse 33. He will put the righteous people on his right and the others on his left. Then the king will say to the people on his right, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, come and possess the kingdom which has been prepared for you ever since the creation of the world. I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you received me in your homes naked and you clothed me, I was sick and you took care of me, in prison and you visited me. And then of course he turns to the people on the other side and he says, I was all those things and you didn't take care of me. So we know the story. What are we supposed to learn from that? It gets back to how we started, do unto others. But I thought we were saved by faith. What's with this work stuff? <laughs> but our faith, faith makes us do certain things. It just comes naturally once you really do have faith. You just behave differently you toward mean, people. You mean, you mean faith works? Yes. <laughs> well said. <laughs> faith works, it does. Yeah. It, if we have a real relationship with God, especially we have if we have a developing relationship as this lesson is talking about, it makes a difference in the way we behave. And what do we learn from John 13, 35? Everyone will notice. Matthew 5, 16. When you behave like this, what happens? The whole world knows and they glorify who? Our Father. Our Father in heaven. There's an, old, there's an old male quartet song that says, Prayer is the, the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. Yeah. That sums it up. I never forgot that. But so, having. So, so mm -hmm. there was this uh, judgment the sheep versus the goats. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who said, But what about the good goats? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, a goat can become a sheep. <laughs> <laughs> a good goat is a sheep. Well, you know, why do you suppose they put the goat separate from the sheep at night time? Because that's what he's talking about, separating the sheep from the goats. Why, why do they separate the two? Well, actually, goats are smarter than sheep. They are smarter. Yeah. It's sheep some, are pretty it's, dumb. There's nothing dumb about Stinking, than sheep. useless, okay. actually, from what I hear from farmers. Yes. But having said that, I'm still asking my question, <laughs> what's different about sheep and goats that would make you want to separate them? One may be volatile, the other one is kind and, oh, I have no idea. Sheep have, I mean, I'm sorry, goats have very little, much less hair, let's say. They tend to jam together to keep warm at nighttime. The sheep have plenty of, 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 of uh, what do I call it? insulation, whatever you want to call it, 
co a thick coat on them, yeah. and they 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 don't they don't jam together, they don't go with the crowd, they stand out by themselves. I don't know. Maybe we could learn something. Are you saying ball-headed men are goats? <laughs> no, I didn't say that. <laughs> well, people without beard. No, are goats are you beard. saying that sheep can? stand on their own because when you think of a sheep you think of something that very submissively follows mm -hmm. a sheep submissively follows god but can stand on its own is that what you're saying well i'm i'm just telling you what this is what the the experts say that that's the difference between sheep and goats sheep is very vulnerable mm -hmm. goats as he says are smarter i've handled sheep as in <laughs> as a youngster on my grandfather's farm, and trust me, there is nothing sillier than a sheep. <laughs> <laughs> well, goats can climb, they can think. She sheep are uh, pretty well off in cold weather, hot weather, you've got to watch them, particularly if there's blowflies around, and I won't enlarge on that. Yeah. And gates, uh, goats, no, there's a different, different are, thing entirely. Are we not to take this simile too far? Let's be careful. And, and just say he was saying two kinds of animals. It could be uh, separating the tulips from the roses just as Maybe. well. Well, there's going to be some people. Let's talk about another group. Some people in this same judgment, while well, God is separating the sheep from the goats, who are going to come up and say, Lord, haven't we done many good things in your name? Why, we've cast out devils. We've performed miracles. They're probably even claiming that they raised people from the dead. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. And Jesus is going to turn them away sadly. And what's he going to say? I never knew you. I what? never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. Never knew you. Wow. Yeah, explain why. Explain why Jesus never knew them. Especially when, when Jesus was here, the disciples came back one time and said, hey, there's people doing this, so they don't even know anything about you, but they're, you know, they're healing and so forth. And Jesus said, you know, leave them alone. Mm -hmm. If they're doing things, so it, it seems like a like a, a like a reversal, a, like a juxtaposition yeah. here. This is a different situation. It's I think it's a hypocrisy. Yeah, it's a intent. In there. These are people like you see on television on Sunday morning exactly. who pretend to be doing miracles, and they're probably forgeries. Do they pretend to be Jesus' followers? Yes. But if you look at their life during the 24-hour day, you will not see an iota of Jesus-like behavior. I'm glad you said that, not me. <laughs> it's more equated with the or, Pharisees. Or is this possibly referring to specific things at end time where <clears throat> people and even the devil will be doing yeah. Miracles. And, uh, is, Particularly. Is, is that sp uh, especially? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> they should have known better. Yeah. Probably well, did. Well, the interesting thing is that at the end of each of those lists in Matthew 25, <coughs> Jesus talks about the least of these, my brethren. The least of my brethren. Who, who, who is Jesus talking about when he talks about the least of my brethren? That's confusing. Okay. I ever never knew. This ones that had the least information and access to him or God or Holy Well, Spirit. fortunately, Lord. you know that I'm going to turn to Ellen White. She's going to help us. Good. Those whom Christ commands in the judgment may have known little of theology, but they have cherished his principles. Through the influence of the divine spirit, they have been a blessing to those about them. Even among the heathen are those who have cherished the spirit of kindness before the words of life had fallen upon their ears. They have befriended the missionaries, even ministering to them at the peril of their own lives. Among the heathen are those who worship God ignorantly, those to whom the light is never brought by human instrumentality. Yet they will not perish. Though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them in nature and have done the things which the law required. Their works are evidence that the Holy Spirit has touched their hearts and they are recognized as the children of God. Desire of Ages, page 638. Well, so there's a, be a phrase in there, something yeah, that about be yeah. complying with, with the law of God. But there's, there's a, 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 beside that, um, you know, we've, we're setting up here in this lesson pretty high standard 
of we human talked about that, didn't we? Uh, of human con conduct, and I think <clears throat> around this table and probably around the tables of a lot of our viewers are saying, you know, I, I'm not going to make this. Now, Gordon said, well, it's the direction you're headed, and well, when, what time is this? Are we talking about a deathbed con conversion here, or <clears throat> what, well, what, how, do I, how am I going to fit into this? I think there's a lot of people, it doesn't look like I'm going to fit here. Well, the answer is this. <clears throat> this is the aim. This is the, the goal for us. Not, I haven't seen anybody around walking and talking and acting like Jesus. I could read you other quotations that said, if we had the same relationship to God that Jesus had, we could do the same things he did. Have you seen anybody walking around performing miracles? No. But aren't they, we supposed to be doing that? Well, but the point is, that's our goal. See, if we could give up our selfishness and start even gently in that you know, direction. We have to give that up in order to, to be able to walk through those pearly gates many, or go up into heaven when Jesus comes? Or How many dedicated <coughs> selfish people are going to be walking through the pearly gates? Not too many. We, when, when are we going to learn this? I think, I think the principle is once you start to learn a better way, you're expected to do something about improving mm -hmm. yourself. And hopefully, day by day, you reach gradually a higher plane. But it's not easy. It's never been let, easy. Let me, let me give you a few more things from our, from our lesson. Maybe the toughest command that God ever gave to practicing Christians is found in Luke 6, 27 and 28, and Matthew 5, 44. That's one of the ones that you talked about, love your enemies. Is it really possible to love your enemies? Jesus identified three characteristics of enemies. One, they manifest hostile attitudes toward us. They may speak bad words about us. They may actually abuse us, even per persecute us. So, what does he say we should do? He tells us to respond in three appropriate ways. One, treat them well. Speak well about them and pray for them. What does it do to us as humans to treat our enemies in these ways? With a hot, cold one. <laughs> <coughs> And that's pouring <laughs> coals on their head. Yeah, exactly. It's amazing that Jesus on the cross, after all the torture, and say, "Father, forgive them. Yeah. They do not what they do." Well, the only possible way uh, that this is the only way this is possible, apart from a hypocritical, offensive, lying behavior. I mean, someone could maybe put on a show, pretend to be doing this for a little while, is to consistently look to Jesus and practice being like Him. If we turn our enemy into our friend, have we destroyed our enemy? So why did Jesus tell us we needed to love our enemies? So is he trying to tell us, okay, do something impossible? <coughs> What's or is best he saying, for us? Hmm? What's best for us? That's I don't how know how you can love an enemy who keeps keeps at you, at you, at you. I Difficult. mean... It's not easy. We're well, going to have to do it, Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> but it, well, you don't do it on your own. No. But it depends on what we mean by love. Mm -hmm. I think we just... It depends on what we mean by love the enemy. You know, mm -hmm. Because you can uh, have what we mentioned, agape love. Remember that this person is a human being and... Uh, you know, have some sort of God in him, hopefully, and leave it at that. But I don't think you're supposed to love somebody that's a horrible person and keeps doing terrible things. Mm -hmm. And you keep yourself open to this person keep hurting you or others. I don't believe that. And there, there are miracles to solve that problem. Corey Ten Boom, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the story of she finally ran into a man who had, who had, you know, been one of her guards and came up and asked her forgiveness. and. It was very, you know, she had to, she had to send a prayer there instantly in order to do that. Yeah. <coughs> well, this is how we come to be like God. That's our goal. I'm not saying any of you are doing it. I'm saying that's the goal. That's where we need to be headed. And Jesus gives us arguments. He says, this is what you need to do. One, doing these things separates us from the low standard of the world. One. Two. We will be rewarded by God for that kind of behavior because it actually changes us to become more like Him. Three, the kind, that kind of behavior is powerful evidence of our Christianity, and we already read that, didn't we? Mm -hmm. 
if you have this kind of love, everybody will know that you're Christ's disciple. We, we should not forget Romans 5.10 that says, God loved us when we were what? Dead sinners. Still his enemies. Well, it would be naturally human to say these standards are impossible for human beings, but God has made them possible by providing the means to accomplish it. And here's another quotation from Ellen White, Mount of Blessings, page 76, paragraph 2. This standard is not one to which we cannot attain. In every command or injunction that God gives, there is a promise, the most positive underlying the command. God has made provision that we may become like unto him, and he will accomplish this for all who do not interpose a perverse will and thus frustrate his grace. In other words, how do we accomplish this? We let God do his work. We give God permission. God change me. Yep. In his final hours with his disciples, Jesus used a vine to illustrate how things are to be accomplished, and of course, you know, as our time, watching the time run down, we need to be so closely connected to Jesus, it's like a branch to the vine. So who are the people we should be reaching out to every day? All around us, again, Ellen White, are poor, tried souls that need sympathizing words and helpful deeds. There are widows who need sympathy and assistance. There are orphans whom Christ has bidden his followers to receive the, as a trust from God. Too often, these are passed by with neglect. They may be ragged, uncouth, and seemingly in every way unattractive, yet they are God's property. They have been bought with a price. They are as precious in His sight as we are. They are members of God's great household and Christians as His stewards are responsible for them. Their souls, He says, will I require at thine hands. Christ Object Lessons 386 and 387. It is not the greatness of the work which we do, but the love and fidelity with which we do it that wins the approval of the Savior. It is the use which we make of our talents which determines our will or weal. We may have fail, we may have faith to remove mountains and understand all mysteries and give our bodies and so forth, you know the first Corinthians thirteen. But if we do all these things and we don't have love, we're a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And that's in Heavenly Places, page three twenty five. How many people pretend to be Christians and aren't doing this?